All right, all right. Welcome to the next latest and greatest webinar on uh, CIS 210, Principles of Computer Programming 1, here at GMC. I am Professor Lusby, and I wanted to create another uh, weekly webinar recording here concerning uh, week five, right? So for sure, we're, we're over the hump. Um, we're we're uh, past the midway point, uh, and I want to make sure that you know exactly uh, what needs to be done here uh, for week five. Uh, I assume everyone is very comfortable and familiar with the classroom by now. If you've missed any of the previous webinar recordings, they are here uh, at the top of the classroom. Um, and then, of course, uh, the only other super important link here is the uh, virtual desktop, uh, right, that has everything that you need uh, to complete these assignments uh, installed, including NetBeans, including Java. Okay, and I'm going to demonstrate how to use that uh, here in a second in order to do uh, what it is that we need for week five. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in here and go down here to week five. And uh, we're going to see that week five, well, let's go to the overview and objectives page here, uh, teaches us about conditional uh, and selection operations. All right. Uh, and these logical constructs is what gives uh, every programming language intelligence, right? Because up to this point, um, all of our programs are sequential in nature. We start at the, at the very top of the program and the computer just uh, reads each command line by line, one at a time until it gets to the bottom and it's done. But with these conditional statements, we can actually have it uh, check for a particular uh, uh, condition using uh, some mathematical operators, right? Greater than, less than, equal to. Um, and if we chain enough of them together, uh, well, then we get uh, a primitive form of, of AI, right? Where we can actually really give the, the program some intelligence. But even one uh, conditional statement enables your program to have two different flows, right? Maybe there's Maybe your program is responsible for doing a few different features and not just uh, one feature, or it needs to be very specific as to when you enter this data, you do this. If you enter this data, you do this instead. So for sure, a super important um, concept here uh, in, I believe it's chapter five. All right. Uh, you want to make sure you read over and, and are comfortable with everything in uh, chapter five of your your textbook here, right? And um, chapter five is called flow of control. Uh, and one ways one of the ways that we can control that flow is using what's called the selection statements. Uh, there's a couple of different types of selection statements that we can create. If and else uh, is definitely uh, the first type of conditional statements, and and there's probably used the most frequently, uh, but there's also something called a switch statement that can be used um, whenever we have a small number of uh, uh, of conditions, very specific conditions that can occur. Um, we can utilize a switch statement. So this chapter focuses in on both of them. Uh, for sure, there's a lot of good uh, examples inside the book, uh, and I would definitely suggest looking at them in particular. I think 5.4 has a lot of good uh, showing you how to use the if statements and how to create these conditions in between the parentheses. And then, of course, we always have our curly brackets that uh, signify scope. But the most important thing to remember about if statements is that uh, the way they work is if they examine whatever this condition is, and this is true, all right. If whatever is in the in the parentheses there next to if is true, it will always execute what is directly underneath of it. All right. If it's true, and for a lot of students who are new to programming, they miss that 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 little bit there. Right. Um, they don't understand why there's a block under underneath of this if statement. Uh, just know with every programming language out there, if this condition is true then you will go and execute whatever's the if body directly underneath of it. This is always the true uh, the true part of the code for that if statement. 
all right? If this is false, well, then you can include what's called an else statement. And else, the else body, right? We got curly brackets here, whatever's in the else body, uh, will always execute if this is false, all right? And else is always optional. Maybe you only care about the true condition and you only care about doing something unique for that, for that one true condition. But if you want to do something unique for the false condition as well, we can include something called else. Um, else if, um, I would say in the beginning, don't worry too much about it, but in industry, uh, else if definitely makes your code more efficient because what happens is, is this else if, this condition, and again, we're looking for a true condition, this will only be examined if the one above it is false. That's what this else if does. All right. So what what that means is that if you use else if, it's not going to look at every single one of these conditions. Uh, if the first one evaluates the true, it's going to skip all the rest of these. Right. If all of these are if statements, right, not else if, if all of these are if statements, it's going to examine every single one of these. And maybe that doesn't make sense. Right. Maybe it's a mutually exclusive uh, type of scenario where it can only be one of these three conditions. So why are we executing three else's if that is the case? That's when you include uh, the the else if logic. But um, again, that's all in the textbook here. Lots of good examples here. I believe I posted this to the, the discussion. Um, you know, and so you definitely want to look over these examples, maybe type them in, maybe use the debugger to, to step through them and, and see what's going on. And we'll do that in a second for uh, for some of the code. Uh, presented here. All right. But the key is definitely, yeah, looking at these examples and kind of wrapping your head around them before attempting uh, the, uh, well, the discussion or the um, the programming assignment uh, for this week. All right. So that is the textbook here. And where were we? Right. So we talked about overview and objectives. We talked about flow of control in the textbook. Uh, and how important that is. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, we always have the supplemental uh, resources link for week five here. And again, some students find this useful. Some students find it confusing. Uh, if it confuses you, always come back uh, to the textbook, okay? Uh, and if you're still confused uh, with the textbook, by all means, that's why I'm here. That's why we're here. Uh, definitely reach out to your instructor, and uh, we can help you with that, all right? Um, all right, so enough about that. What is it specifically that we need to do for this week? Well, uh, very much like previous weeks, we have a discussion forum, we have a programming assignment, and we have a quiz. So not as intensive as week four, right? Thank goodness. In fact, uh, this should be, uh, I'm not going to say easier. Uh, there's fewer assignments, but you know, we're dealing with this new conditional uh, logical structure that we need to get our head wrapped around, and, and that's one of the one of the reasons. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, okay the discussion. What in the heck do we need to do for the discussion here? Uh, it wants us to go into the textbook and complete looks like programming activity two in chapter five, or at least attempt to complete it. At least for me. And then once you attempt to complete it, um, answer these uh, four questions here in the uh, in the discussion forum. But how do we go about uh, even attempting to complete this particular programming activity? Well, I'm glad you asked. What we do is we launch our handy dandy virtual desktop, which everyone should be able to do at this point. Um, and we are going to uh yeah let's go into NetBeans right like we always do and we're going to create a new project right shouldn't be anything new at this point and for any of these programming assignments we always want to create a new project we're going to create a java java application all right java java application give it a nice descriptive name um uh what is this week five discussion let's say right um, and down here because this is from the textbook they already give us the files so we're gonna make sure that this is unchecked 
Make sure this is unchecked. We're not going to change this. This is a good default location for us to use. And uh, once all that looks good, bada boom, bada bing, we click on finish. And we have a nice empty project here with an empty default package. That is perfect, and that is what we want. Now the question is, well, where do we get? I guess we should take a look at what heck we're supposed to do. Where is it? A little off today. Where is part two? Program activity two. Using the switch statement. Um, they want us to use the files from the book, in particular, modify a certain section of um, the selection practice to controller.java. Um, right? Uh, copy to a folder all the files in this chapter's program activity two folder. <clears throat> all right, where the heck do we get that? Here's what I say. In the virtual desktop, log in to the classroom inside of the virtual desktop. All right. And um, in the classroom, if you scroll down a little bit, I think right above the, or right below the virtual desktop here, CIS 210 Program Assignment Frameworks. Go ahead and click on that. It'll download a zip file. Go ahead and open up that zip file. And if I'm going too fast, please pause the video uh, to get there. All right. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, let's go into source code. Let's go into chapter five. Let's go down here to programming activity two. And um, I organize it by file type because we are only interested in these five files. We are not interested. We, we don't care about the class files. All right. So go ahead and highlight those five files, right? You can draw a rectangle over them if you want by holding down the left mouse button. You can select the first one, hold down shift, and select the last one. But regardless, we need to highlight those five files. So that's the code that we need. Now what we're going to do is we're going to minimize those. I'm going to go back to NetBeans, make sure this is in the foreground. Uh, open up File Explorer where we had those five files. And let's drag and drop them here into the default package, right? Hold the left mouse button down and then release the mouse button here on, uh, on default package. And we should see that we have all five of these files. Notice that this week, and I don't know if we've had this yet, this might be the first week where we are actually including an FXML file. All right. Um, so... It's more than just the Java. You need all four Java files and this .xml file, all right? Because what you're going to see is if you don't include this, you're going to get errors when you try to run it, all right? Um, okay, now let's kind of take a look at the code here. Uh, what we're going to see here is that this is a Java FX application, right? We're extending the application. Um, and again, this is all kind of above and beyond this, the scope of, of this class, right? Where this is an intro to programming in Java, but they they utilize JavaFX so that um, they can show us, they can, they can give us a GUI that we can play with. And they just want us to go in and modify, let me show you. They just want us to go in and modify here, this work with switch code. That's it, all right? Um, everything else outside of this, if this were CIS 211, I would love to walk you through it and show you how all these different classes connect and how all the different <clears throat> events connect. But I don't want to, uh, it's a little beyond the scope uh, of this course. All right. So just import the files, look for this work with switch function. And this is where you want to add your code using a switch statement, right? That basically, uh, what do they say here? Write the case statements for the following constants, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, as well as a default statement. So they want this work with switch function to be able to process these five values. And if one of those five values is not there, then uh, what happens is, is it falls through to the, the default statement. And the default statement is, well, it's none of those values, maybe print an error or maybe give some sort of default value because uh, obviously the input wasn't good.
all right? Um, and then inside of each case statement, we want to print a message to the screen indicating which value was the input, right? Which one of these values was the input. If it's the default case, indicate it's not a valid value. So if we hit default, it's not zero to four, it's not valid. And then the other thing we need to do inside of each case statement is call the animate method. All right, and this animate method is gonna basically, <clears throat> under the hood, uh, make the GUI do something animate -y. Is animate a word? Uh, it's gonna make the GUI uh, flat, do something to where we can actually see that our program is working. All right, um, and then that's it. So write a switch, bunch of case statements inside of each case statement. We need a print statement and an animate. Um, and then if we do everything right and we run it, it's going to ask us to enter an integer. And if we put in zero through four, what's well, going to call animate and it's going to change what the GUI looks like and show us the path that the switch statement took for a particular value. Okay. That's the idea here. That's what we're trying to do with this particular uh, discussion. All right. So definitely make an attempt and maybe you're successful, maybe you're not, but either way you have something to talk about in the discussion. I would like to show you the solution, right? Uh, just so that you can kind of get an idea as to how, just in case uh, you weren't able to find the solution. So uh, before the webinar, I created uh, the solution here. Uh, did exactly what I just showed you, right, with the, the project and adding the files. And then I went in here, and this is what I came up with for at least one possible solution. And I don't, honestly, the, the way they've constrained us with these requirements, I don't know if there is more than one solution to this. Um, I guess we could replace the switch and the case statements with if statements, and it would probably do the same thing. So yeah, yeah, there is more than one way to do this. But I mean, they're calling out in the instructions, use a switch statement, use a case statement, call the animate methods. And that's what we're doing here. Here's the switch. And notice that the switch statement, uh, you have to pass a value into the switch statement and it's going to look at this value and if it's let's say zero well then it's going to come down here and execute the, the case zero logic if it's one it's going to come down here and execute the case one logic if it's two right down here to two um, all the way down to four so we've got unique um, case logic for at least these five values zero one two three four now, if it goes to look at this value and it's not 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and fall down here to default and execute whatever is inside of, uh, of default is. So default gives us a way, kind of a catch-all, just in case uh, this value doesn't hit one of these five cases, which it should, then uh, uh, the switch statement is going to execute this default logic down here. All right. So, you know, this is an exercise on how to use the switch statement. Make sure that you know how to declare the switch. Make sure that you know how to declare the case, right? Notice that the case uses a colon instead of a semicolon, right? And the other important part about a switch statement is that um, you do want a, a break, what's called a break statement at the end of each case. And this is pretty darn important because without this break, what it would do is, let's say the value zero, it would jump to case zero, execute this, execute this. If that break wasn't there, it would keep going even down into the case one logic. All right. So this break is there so that you just execute the case zero logic and then get out of there, get out of that switch statement. Case one, right? Execute the, the case one logic, get out of there. Um, there are some nuance ways where it is intentional. Some people do uh, intentionally leave out the break. Uh, 
but you have to really know what you're doing. I would say nine times out of 10, you always, always, always have a break at the end of each case statement. So that should always be your go-to. All right. Um, all right. So if, if we do this and we run it, we should see something that looks like this, where it's asking us to enter an integer. Let's say we put in two and we click on test. Well, then we see, all right, well, we hit the switch statement, case zero, nope, nope, aha, it was case two, so it executed the case two logic, and it printed out the value is two, see, value is two, and then it continued, and we can do this again, all right, citing. Um, you see how anything but zero to five hits default, right, even if we put in negative 100. It's going to hit default. All right. Um, so that's how we use the, the switch statement and how we complete uh, programming activity two uh, for this week's discussion. All right. What else? So we're talking about discussion form. Um, all right. Week five programming assignment. Let's take a look at that. Wait a second, here we are. Okay, so this week's programming assignment basically wants us to write a program for NASA that looks at weather conditions to make sure that they can launch, let's say the new Artemis rocket. Well, uh, Artemis is the name of the capsule, but anyways, the, the, the new rocket. Uh, it should ask the user for the wind speed and the temperature. If the wind speed is above 30 miles an hour or the daily temperature is below 41, then we got a no-go situation, right? The, the, the rocket needs to be aborted. The launch needs to be aborted. Uh, if otherwise, if it's less than, right, if the it's the opposite, less than 30 miles an hour or the daily temperature is at or above 41, then we can, we'll go for launch, all right? Uh, wants us to call it rocket launch um, dot Java um, and then here they're very specific as to what your program input and output uh, should look like and uh, so your prompt for the wind speed should look like this and then this is the user typing in 15 right here's the prompt for the daily temperature and the user should type in 75 and in this situation, well, yeah, the wind speed is below 30, so that's good. The temperature is above 41 degrees, so that's good. So for sure, weather conditions are good. This is what your program should print out under, the, under these two uh, conditions. The rocket is go for launch. Uh, but let's say that up oh, wind speed's too high, temperature's fine, but wind speed's too high, well, then we got to abort, all right? Uh, here, wind speed's fine, but temperature's too low, so we got to abort. Here, wind speed's way too high, and the temperature's way too low, so we got to abort. Notice that in each, each one of these scenarios, we're testing a different, unique combination of input, right? Um, we can't just create a program, especially when we're using conditional logic that you know we we run one test and that one test works great and we go you know woo we're done ship it no 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 because as soon as we start to have that conditional logic we have multiple flows right one of the flows is when they're both good well the rocket is is go for lunch one of the flows is well one's good and one's bad well then we got to test that condition the other flow is the opposite well this one's good but this one's bad right and then here they're both bad so um that's what in the directions um oh my gosh what is here this is what this means screenshots of program running showing proper input and output for 100 percent test coverage because once we start in a, to create this conditional logic and later on we're going to create loops uh that have conditions in them all of a sudden uh, uh that depending on what the input to the program is 
uh, the output could be different. Uh, the behavior of the program could be different altogether. So now we're in a situation where uh, just testing with one set of values, taking a screenshot and, and you know, submitting your assignment, that's not good enough. Um, you need to think about all the conditions that are possible, uh, or at least as close to as many conditions that you can think of. Uh, and you need to run the program with those conditions, take a screenshot for each one of those conditions. So for sure, once you think you're done with this program, you're going to need at least four screenshots uh, that utilize at least these four different scenarios. And maybe you can come up with more, right? Maybe there's even more scenarios than this. What happens if the user types in words instead of numbers? What's going to happen, right? Um, but for sure, at a minimum, uh, you need to do these four uh, scenarios here. All right, so how do we go about doing this? All right, well, I'm glad you asked. We go to our nice handy-dandy remote desktop, right? We launch NetBeans. We create, let me close all this so we don't get confused. We create a new project, new Java. Java application, uh, 23 days, and this is the week five, I believe, assignment. Okay, leave this as the default location. Uncheck this. Now on the create main class, yeah, we are creating from scratch here. We don't have any of the textbook code to, to import. And I am getting some questions concerning this. Um, some of you are saying that you have a package created, declared, and that's fine. Uh, but some of you, bottom line is this, make your life easy. Get rid of, you see what happened there? And I, uh, let's see if I can get it to do it again. Yeah. You see how there's a dot here, 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 here. Basically it puts a dot wherever there's a space and each one of these dots, the, the name in front of these dots, is a package name. Um, and you end up with a very long package structure. I say in CIS 210, don't worry about it. In industry, do we want to create packages? You betcha. But for right now, let's just focus in on the code. Let's not worry about the, the project structure. Let's not worry about creating packages yet. All right, so if you see any dots in there, Get rid of the dots. Get rid of whatever's before those dots and just say create main class. Give it the the, the name of, of your, your main class, which is usually the same name as the project. All right. Go ahead and click on finish, and we should see a nice new project. Here's your default package, right, because we got rid of all those packages. So that's why it says default. And then here is our uh, our Java file that it created for us called CIS 210 Week 5 Assignment because it has a class inside of it, right? Called CIS 210 Week 5 Assignment. And these have to match up. For Java to compile this, they both have to be the same. Otherwise, it will complain and it will freak out. Um, up, to, up to you what you do with those comments. As long as uh, your code looks good and is well documented, uh, I am happy. Uh, but I'll say this. Where did it go? Where did it go? Here, rocketlaunch.java, right? Um, if you create your project with the, the wrong name like I did, right click over here, say refactor, and say the name, I think. And let's give it a new name. What was it? Rocket Launch, I believe. Rocketlaunch.java, sure, apply, rename, looks good. Bada boom, bada bing, it does all the work for us. All right, so this is our main starting point for the week five assignment. Uh, we have our main method, we have our class. Uh, now what? Well, now we need to meet these requirements here, um, but I understand a lot of you are new to programming, so I did before this webinar, create another project doing exactly what I just showed you, right? New project, uh, new main 
new main class, right? Um, and so let me show you some guidance here that'll hopefully help. All right, and even here I, I called it the wrong name. So uh, do I want to change this? Sure. I'm going to change this. Let's see here. What did I say? Refactor. Where did it go? There it is. It's gone. I'm going to call it Rocket Launch. Roger. All right, so here's our nice rocket launch class with the main method. Um, again, make sure you've got your assignment information at the top, please. Um, and here uh, is some guidance as to at least one possible solution for this. Um, obviously, if, if our application is involving wind speed and temperature data, well, we should probably create a couple variables that hold that wind speed and temperature data. I'm a little vague as to what data type should be used, but I'll let you kind of figure that out. Okay. And if we look at the requirements, well, this is what the user is going to be typing in. So up to you as far as what you want that, the data type of your, your variables to be. All right. Uh, and then remember, IPO paradigm, input, process, output. Well, what's the input? Well, that's what we need the user's help with, right? Ask the user for the wind speed um, uh, with the exact, yeah, use, don't don't get too creative here. Uh, try to use the exact same output that's listed in the requirements. It's going to make my life easier when I'm, when I'm grading, all right? So you want to print this out to the screen and ask the user, for input and then whatever they type in here you store it in the wind speed variable right you want to print this out to the screen we're called prompting you want to prompt the user with this and whatever they type in here we're going to store it in the variable uh, that stores temperature all right so that is what this is uh, basically outlining all right then once we have those two pieces of information from the user and they're stored inside of a variable well, here is where the process, the magic happens. We need to use some selection logic here. And, and uh, I'll be a little more specific. Um, your programming activity two talked about the switch statement. Here, the switch statement is not going to work. You need to use the if statement for sure. And maybe even the else statement. But the switch logic is just, uh, switch works well when, right? when we switch works well when you have very specific values 0 1 2 3 or 4 or 5 here we've got a whole range of values right i mean wind speed could be what anything from 0 to a well a thousand i don't know is there such thing as a thousand mile an hour winds on jupiter there is um even higher actually uh, and then the daily temperature, well, what could a daily temperature be? I don't know, negative, <laughs> negative whatever to, to positive whatever. So there's these huge range of values. The switch statement is not going not gonna to work. We're going to need to use the if statement. And in fact, if you look in your textbook, I think it's under, this is more like what is needed for your assignment, programming activity one, um, where you're writing if and else statements in order to complete programming activity one. And in fact, I wish that uh, the, the discussion would have focused in on this one a little more than the switch statement. Okay. Um, so for sure you want to use if and else. And also you've got two conditions that you're looking for here, right? You, you need to look at the wind speed and the temperature, right? Wind speed is above 30, temperature is below 41. Um, and you need to, uh, use what's, uh, you need to or them together. Now, where do they talk about and and or, uh, I think it's in nested if else statements. Yeah, you could, you could, if you don't want to use the or, you could use some nested if logic 
to where you check the one condition, and if that condition's true, you, you check the second condition. Um, and again, there's always 10 different ways to write the same program. Uh, the other way is, and I don't know if they talk about it here in the textbook yet, using AND and OR logical operators. So I'll leave it to you if you want to use the AND or the OR conditional logic. Uh, but either way, use the IF, maybe the ELSE, in order to check these two conditions. And if they are both true, well, if this logic is true, then you say abort. If this logic is false, then you say it's go for launch. Uh, so if you change this logic, then uh, it, it might change the way things are output down below, right? So, um, all right, that's all the, the guidance I can really give here without providing the solution. Um, yeah, there's at least, there's a bunch of different ways we can structure these conditions in order to meet the, this process uh, and the output. And I would say just start out looking at the wind speed and making sure that you can say if it's go for launch or abort just based on a wind speed. And then make sure you can do just the temperature. Make sure that says. And then try to join those two conditions together um, and, and test, right? Well, let's say the wind speed is good, but the temperature is bad. Or wind speed is bad and the temperature is good. Um, but try to do it piecemeal. Try to do the, the wind speed first, make sure it looks good. Try to do temperature next, make sure it looks good. Then say, okay. Now that I know that logic works, those two things work well, let's try to join them uh, together um, and see where you can get uh, with that using probably nested, it looks like nested if statements because I don't think, uh, I don't see them talking about the and and or logic here. Might not be till, till later. Okay. Um, what else? So, oh, right. So then once we have this, let's say that, you know, you have your solution, right? Uh, don't forget the results document. Don't forget to put this information at the top. Copy and paste the code, uh, all of it, right below it in the Word document. But then you're going to need to run this program at least four times, right? You're going to need to run this scenario. Take a screenshot. Run this scenario, take a screenshot. Run this scenario, take a screenshot. Run this scenario, take a screenshot. Okay. Or I suppose if you make your output window big enough, you could just run maybe all four of these scenarios at, at once. It depends on how you structure your program. Oh, you don't know about looping yet. You're going to have to run it four different times. You're going to have to run it four different times and then put in these unique values with each one of those runs and just take a screenshot each time and I'll be good. Okay. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Right. So that's the uh, results document. And I showed how to do that in week four. So I'm, I'm going to assume that everyone's good creating a, a results document using Word at this point and using what's called the snipping tool in order to uh, grab those, those screenshots. So review the week four video uh, if not. Um, what else? Well, for the assignment, that's basically it. Um, you know, the complexity here is not the length of the program. The complexity here is the proper if-else statements in order to detect the launch conditions and the abort launch conditions, right? This is where things get fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, what else? Is there anything else for this week? Oh, yeah, the quiz. Uh, well, when is the quiz over? The quiz is over. Chapter 5. Go figure. Uh, 10 questions, 25 minutes to take it, one attempt. Uh, so make sure that you are very familiar with Chapter 5 uh, before taking it. I think there might be a, a couple of open, what is it called, open-ended essay questions like the previous quizzes. So this might be a typo. I don't, I don't think it's just 10 multiple choice, but I'd have to look into that. All right. So be well prepared. 
or week five. It's, not, it's 10 questions, at least it's not a midterm, right? Like last week, uh, this should be a little bit easier than, than last week for sure. Um, and that is basically it for week five. Uh, I hope everyone continues to find these webinar videos useful. Please continue to provide me feedback, either leave a comment, like the video, email me, uh, whatever it is. That's what helps me uh, make these videos better. Okay, so have a great rest of your week and let me know if I can help.